Okay. All right. Uh, the title of this talk is Paintbrush for Hire, the East Tennessee Odyssey of James and Emma, Emma Cameron. And that's Emma on the screen now. See. Today I'll be discussing a selection of James Cameron paintings in chronological order, commencing with the year 1854. For your convenience, I supply a date place log which has been extracted from the correspondence and diaries of the artist and his wife, Emma S. Cameron. The sources are with the James and Emma S. Cameron papers, 1846 to 1876, contained in the special collections and archives of Olin Library at Mills College in Oakland, California. These papers were collected by Mills faculty member Rosalind Keep now deceased. I also rely upon bibli uh, bibliographic material not contained in the archive as long as it doesn't uh, contradict the primary sources that the archive has. James was born in Greenock, Scotland in 1816, Emma in 1825 in Philadelphia, the uh, city in which they were both married around, which they were both married, isn't it? in which they were married around 1844. If we could have the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, both died in Oakland, James in 1882 and Emma in 1907, and were buried in Mountain View Cemetery in that city. My date place log spans the years from 1862, or from 1816 to 1862. After the latter year, James would devote his energies to the uh, avocation of itinerant pastor Hopefully the date place log that I've supplied uh, will serve as a reminder of contextual material. I don't have even a chance of a time uh, to, dis uh, to discuss here. 1854. Long Lake, oil on canvas, 26 by 42 inches. Partial signature, James Cameron, at the bottom center partially obscured by the frame. In the Adirondack Museum, Blue Mountain Lake, New York. We behold the calm and luminous surface of a lake, the shape of an elongated horseshoe, bounded by thickly forested hills, stretching into great distance. A company of resting ducks were at the right. A single bird splashes down at center. Above is a tranquil sky in which are a few fair-weather clouds. Like most of Cameron's clouds, these have a stagey artificial appearance, a bare outcropping at bottom center. Beyond it, a tree branch breaks the water's surface, projecting a scarecrow-like hand at the uh, comical duck. Faint color glazes have been applied to its forms, but Long Lake feels to me cold and unyielding, uh, essentially a study in black and white. The walls of pine, the outcropping, the tree limb, the, the exception is the gently burnished areas of reflected shadow at the water's edges, have been emphatically outlined. The telescoped mountains at the lake's end, they remind me of a shark's tooth, add to the chill. What tranquil, uh, tranquility is conveyed by the sky and water is overshadowed by a contrary motif in the shadowy recesses at the left, can't really see it, a sportsman who rests his shoulder on a, uh, rests on a boulder and whose elbow is propped on a fallen tree, fires his gun at an unseen target inland. Near him appears the prow of a boat, perhaps a canoe and a single oar that seem to be awaiting a fishing party or deer hunters who intend on hounding their prey. <clears throat> Avalanche Lake, oil on canvas, no signature, no date, 28 and a half by 39 inches, owned by Steve Cottom of Knoxville, here attributed to James Cameron. Handwritten inscription on the reverse, if I have this right, Steve, Cameron Lake Windermere, Adirondacks, unquote. 
We are at the center of a lake, bounded by a thick growth of pine, shaped more or less like an arrowhead. The farther shore encircles a small island, above which rises sentinel-like a tall pine tree. A massive rock-strewn pyramid of a mountain, light brown in color, rises from the lake, from behind the lake. On its descending side, on the right, is over, it is overshadowed by a russet-colored embankment that plunges precipitously from the upper right. The point of overlap opens to view a V-shaped slice of open sky, uh, which reflects upside down on the lake's slightly blurred surface. Except for glimpses of cerulean sky and scattered, wispy, stage-set clouds, the painting is a somber study in black and white, or brown and white, I should say. More than in Long Lake, we see evidence that Cameron has glazed and overlayered paint on the surface in an effort to submerge discrete de uh, details into a rich chocolate-colored soup, at least not especially on the right side. This somewhat describes the technique of the Venetian colorists Cameron so much admired. Here, no particular event, no gun blast, distracts us from the prevailing mood of primeval uh, loneliness. On September 12, 1854, from a camp on the south end of Long Lake, New York, Emma Cameron informed her mother-in-law that she and James had hiked through the five Adirondack lakes and on the way had caught many fish and had seen foxes and ducks and loons and hawks and eagles and partridges and that, quote, Mitchell, whose last name is not given, shot a hawk and a bald-headed eagle, uh, a beauty. One morning the dogs drove in a deer, which Mitchell succeeded in clubbing to death. The Mitchell she refers to uh, happens to be the Native American hunter guide, quite famous in his time, Mitchell Sabatis, who had popularized the birch bark canoe as a sportsman's must in traversing Adirondacks waters. 1855. On January 23rd, in 1855, a Burlington, Vermont newspaper reported that Cameron, before departing for the South, exhibited Long Lake and another painting entitled, entitled Avalanche Lake at Arondacks at a Burlington shop. Long Lake uh, sold to a man named Fernarn uh, in Benedict, a Cameron friend who had retired from teaching mathematics at the University of Vermont and uh, lived in property he purchased in the Adirondacks. The origin of Cottom's painting is unknown, but its style and resemblance to the actual Avalanche Lake near Lake Placid, New York, suggests that it uh, and the lost Avalanche Lake mentioned in the newspaper are one and the same. To my knowledge, there is uh, no uh, Lake Windermere in the Adirondacks. And having said that, I'm sure there must be. And somebody's <laughs> going to say, wait a minute. 1856. This is not in your uh, uh, list of works, but you should include that. You should include it in there right now at this point. The title of the painting is Samuel Johnson Voice. We'll go to it. Oil on Canvas. 50 by 74 and a half inches, signed and dated lower right, James, or J. Cameron, 1856. The names of the sitters were inscribed by the artist on the reverse. As of 1987, the painting was in the collection of Mr. and Mrs. Richard Mitchell of Chattanooga. Following an 18th century uh, vogue for conversation piece portraits, Cameron here depicts three adults, three children, and a pet dog during a happy moment or happy reunion. A woman of color wearing a bandana holds the latest born, James S. Boyce. Although each individual assumes a relaxed pose, sitting or leaning, they are impeccably dressed, none more so than little Mary L. Boyce at the center. Adding to the sense of stability is the fact all have been assembled in a pyramidal grouping. Yet the viewer cannot help but be uh, alarmed. The voices are not shown in the family parlor at Sunnyside near Chickamauga Creek Estate. 
but precariously perched near the summit of Chattanooga's overlooked mountain. A dizzying panorama of distant mountains, rolling hills, cultivated fields, the village of Chattanooga, a glimpse of the Tennessee River with McClellan Island, now the Audubon Reserve, at its center, comes into view. Happy Mary and her dog seem about to tumble down the abyss into the churning waters of the Tennessee directly beneath them. I experience a touch of vertigo in looking at that passage. Uh, a few cumulus clouds float benignly overhead, but to the right, uh, a storm is obviously brewing. Cameron loved crafting details. It was an obsession he shared with many anti-modern, quote unquote, American and English painters of his day, the 1840s and 50s. We see evidence of it in Mrs. Mary Latimer Boyce's finely crocheted blouse and the discarded fancy hat beside her skirt, in the binoculars she holds, in the bandana worn by the uh, maid, Boyce's watch chain, every link seems accounted for, or is accounted for, and little Mary's costume, her necklace and hat. These details probably took as many hours to paint as it took an artisan to actually create the fabric that is being imitated. The natural surroundings show this as a well, uh, the natural surroundings show this as well. The still life rendering of the tree limbs and leaves on the left appear to have been freshly cut before being physically attached to the canvas's surface. The balding and bespeckled voice was then 36. He was a successful Chattanooga lawyer and despite his slave-holding inclinations, Cameron's most faithful art patron and friend during the late 1850s. Samuel's parents were Kerr and Nancy Johnson Boyce of Newberry in Charleston, South Carolina. Kerr was a leading Chattanooga landowner and developer and had been co-owner with Colonel James A. Whiteside of the Chattanooga-based East Tennessee Iron and Manufacturing Company. In 1840, Samuel Boyce purchased or practiced law in Charleston. In 1852, he married Mary B. Latimer, a resident of Hamburg, Georgia. The couple began summering in Chattanooga in 1852, prior to the birth of the little Mary in 1853. But they continued to winter at Summerhill, South Carolina, which is three miles just north of the Savannah River across uh, from Augusta, Georgia. The painting was contracted for $1,500 in cash and bartered goods and was well underway at the beginning of January at Summer Hill in this year again, 1856. Since the artist was yet to visit Chattanooga when the canvas was begun, he must have filled in the background from sketches made around June 20th on Lookout Mountain when the Camerons briefly interrupted their Knoxville stay to visit the mountain. The calmly 22-year-old wife and mother, featured in the painting, died soon after the portrait was completed the same year. George Wellington Churchwell, oil on canvas, 27 and 4th by 22 inches, signed and dated J. Cameron Pinsit, you know how they put that fancy Latin uh, abbreviation after their name sometimes, in the Tennessee State Museum, Nashville. The portrait was begun in April at the Coleman House, soon to be the, La the Lamar House, on Knoxville's Gay Street, where Cameron maintained his studio. Before they decided upon single portraits, the artist and his clients, Mrs. Churchwell, uh, joined in the discussions, had decided upon a voice-type family portrait uh, uh, conversation piece uh, type portrait. The outdoor setting was to have been the great loop of the Holston River from a high bluff where the ch uh, Churchwells maintained one of their Knoxville homes. And while work on the painting continued, the Camerons were supposed to receive a free board from the owners. Then 54, George Churchwell was the father of the controversial William Montgomery Churchwell, who incidentally had sat to the portraitist Samuel Shaver, perhaps Cameron's principal 
East Tennessee competitor. William also happens to have owned the Coleman House. George Churchwell began his political and legal career in a, as a crony of Andrew Jackson. He practiced law with and later before Jackson when Jackson was a judge. During Jackson's presidency, Churchwell was appointed Indian agent during the Cherokee removal of the Whig party and a staunch Methodist. He had practiced law in Knoxville for over 35 years and served a single term in Tennessee's 21st General Assembly. Until his death in 1864, Churchwell managed a farm and cattle breeding ranch two miles north of the Knoxville town line, which was worked by over 20 slaves. Churchwell believed slavery to be a divine institution and was adamant that slave families should be humanely treated. To this end, he and his second wife promoted dancing and, and, and uh, musicals among their slave population and encouraged them to attend church and preach gospel. As Churchwell lay dying of natural causes, a detachment of un Union soldiers were pillaging his ranch. The portrait's oval uh, format and gilded frames, frame were much in demand for inexpensive bust light portraits of the day. When Cameron arrived in Knoxville, a town he, that seemed to him too expensive for its own good, the couple's Coleman House arrangements, a, this is a kind of dash here, the, couple, uh, the Coleman House arrangements, a bedroom and studio, uh, rented for $16 a week. Um, he began advancing his fees for small sized portraits, oval portraits like this one, from $75 to $100. Churchwell is formally dressed. He wears his, dye, his thick dyed hair and a pompadour, has thick eyebrows as you can see and full sideburns. His eyes look slightly downward and to the left of our glance. Cameron took out weekly advertisements in William Brownlow's Knoxville wig affirming that he was a painter of portraits in oil, having practiced as an artist in Italy." Unquote. If this were, was intended to suggest that he was prepared to paint Knoxvillians in a perceptibly Italian style, such as exhibited in the portraits by, made by the American artist, artists Washington Alston, William Page, or Daniel Huntington, for example, Churchwell's portrait discounts this, instead of a shadowy psychological study that is enhanced by subtle layerings, and glazings, and scumblings of paint, Churchwell's clothing and facial features are crisply and cleanly lined. The starched shirt, absolutely white, and the, and the clothing and hair, absolutely black. His lips must have been drawn with the smallest of brushes, and perhaps and perhaps with the aid of a magnifying glass. Sophie Moody Park Churchill, oil on canvas, 27 by 22, sight. I didn't actually have a chance to measure it particularly, uh, but close. No signature or date, 1856. Tennessee State Museum, Nashville. It is the pendant to the George Churchwell portrait. George Churchwell's first wife was Rebecca Evelyn Montgomery of South Carolina, with whom he had three children, including William, the notorious William. In 1836, shortly after Rebecca's death, George married Sophie, 1817 to 1896, who was raised in Fulton County, Illinois. Even though Fulton County sent a regiment into battle against the Confederacy, Sophie tenaciously resisted the Union Army's encroachment onto the Churchwell Ranch and the freeing of the Churchwell slaves. The portrait much resembles the already old-fashioned New England fancy portraits painted by John S. Blount et al. John, uh, John S. Blount was a... Um, of uh, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maine artist, and he had a number of friends that painted like him. Historians like to describe these portraits as primitive. 
Sophie's costume and flesh is flatly painted and smoothly finished, and the linear accents are hard-edged. Cameron delighted in reproducing Sophie's accoutrements, her elaborately curled dark brown hair parted in the middle and clasped with an ornament, her delicately tooled shawl lightly covering a garnet or wine-colored velvet dress with undersleeves, the resulting value contrasts with the whitest of white lace collars. Note as well uh, the the uh, double-wrapped Florentine gold chain necklace around her neck. Its links appear to hang from the outside of the canvas, and the emerald and gold pin that is so deliberately encircled by the necklace. With her own feminine vanity aroused, Emma wrote, mother Cam uh, Emma wrote her, <laughs> her mother-in-law mother that because of Mrs. Churchwell's frequent work-related, because of the Churchwell's frequently related absences, James was anxious to finish the wife's portrait first in hopes of attracting, better attracting uh, more commissions. Quote, Emma, all who have seen it are delighted with it. Mrs. Churchwell could not give it for all her house and furniture, both very costly, and says she values it more than anything she possesses. Lions Island 1, oil on canvas, 18 and 1 quarter by 27 and 1 quarter inches, unsigned, undated, 1856, in a private Knoxville collection, inscribed by hand on the reverse, Lions Island, five miles below Knoxville on the Tennessee River. As pointed out above, the Camerons arrived in Knoxville by, the, by rail on, on or about March 15th. In early August, they temporarily left the Coleman House for the rustic farmhouse, set on 300 acres, of Reverend Herman Bolcom, who was located, which was located near the Georgia East Tennessee Railroad in present-day Bearden community. Emma informed Mother Cameron, we are in the country in fulfillment of our expectations. We came here to be near the fine view of the whole steam, she misspells it, which I have already mentioned to you. Mr. Cameron selected his view for sketching from, uh, from sketching, for, uh, view for sketching from, and expected to begin yesterday. But the arrival in Knox of some acquaintances from Macon, Georgia, and their wish to see us, took us uptown where we were all day. Two weeks later, and that's in a quote, two weeks later on August 18th, 1856, Emma confirms that Cameron is, quote, taking a careful study of the view I mentioned and owing to the rain will probably not finish it before the last of the week, unquote. Two weeks later, after storing some belongings, the couple packed and left Knoxville for Chattanooga. Uh, as anyone who has traversed the, uh, uh, the Walk Lake circumventing Knoxville's Lakeshore Park and Lakeshore Mental Institute could instantly confirm, the artist has positioned his easel on the bluff that overlooks Lyons View. It is a clear and calm summer afternoon. The heavily leafed branches of a large elm fill the left half of the canvas. To indicate the leaves, the painter has forcefully uh, laid down a fabric of yellow and black green jabs of viscous paint, as if stitching a tapestry. There were no tubes of paint yet. Uh, there were bladders of paint that he would have had with him. We behold the silver blue expanse of the Holston Today, the captive waters of Fort Loudon Lake, which rise now 10, 10 feet or so above the river's original level. Several wooded islands, one a satellite of the other, cast dim reflections on the river's surface. We look southward. The inclination before us is strewn with, uh, we go back, we go back, uh, 
So two, go back to another. Thank you. The incline before us is strewn with rocky ledges, sundry trees and bushes, a dozen or so moulin plants. To the right is a two-room log cabin and beside it a small clearing containing a haystack and some detached wagon wheels. A whiff of smoke drifts from the the cabin's chimney. Beyond the islands rises an orchestrated overlap of grayish hills and delicately glazed light violet mountains that mark the North Carolina border. In the middle ground, the double peaks of Bays Mountain provide a convenient point of orientation, as does the uh, Chilhawi Mountain, the long ridge at the right of and behind Bays Mountain. I don't know if you can see what I'm talking about here. Through his friend Bochum, a geographer, historian, and publicist, Cameron would have known the Great Smoky Mountains and various starring peaks that we know today as the Unica chain, Cherokee for White Mountains. Since in 1856, cartographers and explorers had yet to complete their definitive work. Cameron has not simply painted a colored daguerreotype for we note important amendments from nature, most particularly to, uh, to Lion Islands. In the painting, the larger of the two appears to have been turned about 180 degrees. Also, the alignment of the island with Bay's Mountain, which is this group here uh, is quite different from what you will see when you go down that pathway. Uh, Bay's Mountain actually would be over here <coughs> in the view. When Cameron set up his easel box and camp stool, he was at the edge of a property named Union Mills, a 500-acre plantation and grist mill, founded on the east bank of the Fourth Creek in early 19th century by Captain William Lyon. After Lyon's death in 1854, his son, Major Thomas Lyon, 1810 to 1864, took charge of the property. The Lyons were slaveholders, and it has been suggested the cabin was based on an actual existing house that uh, boarded enslaved field hands. Whether Lyon and Cameron meant at this time is not known, but a letter written by East Tennessee historian James G. M. Ramsey to his son, General John Crozier Ramsey, um, uh, in that letter uh, that it's in the East Tennessee Historical Society, uh, Charles and Plum Collection, uh, in, uh, the letter suggests that in 1859, both Lyon and Cameron owned paintings similar to the study. Even so, Cameron's strong abolitionist views and Lyon's equally unswerving support for slavery and Southern secession make it obvious the two were not friends. Like its friend Herman Bochum, also a uh, transplanted Northerner, Cameron found little to admire in the slave system or in the atmosphere of Southern indolence that surrounded Knoxville. Yet Lyons Islands 1 projects a note of optimism about the town's business future. The Holston's meager water level and pesky shoals prevented dependable navigation to and from the port of Knoxville. In 1853, however, a federal river improvement project, it paralleled the construction of uh, railroads in and out of Knoxville and East Tennessee, gave substance to a Whig internal improvement program that depended upon the construction of low wing dams and uh, the excavation of channels that made sluice navigation around the shoals feasible. As if celebrating Knoxville's promising future, Cameron, Cameron's study depicts a dam diagonally crossing the river ahead of the islands and the invisible shoals beneath the water. A confident boatman, if you can see real close there, uh, steers his skiff in the general direction of the sluice, which would be to the far right. 
um, parallel, he would be proceeding parallel to the dam. Lyons Island 2, oil on canvas 28.5 by 42.5, unsigned, undated, private collection. Until the late 1990s, it was in the collection of Louise Craig, now deceased. However much Cameron's careful study altered the existing view before it, it was to be a template for copies he would make on demand and, like the first version, the study, uh, of Gilbert Stewart's many replications of George Washington probably remained in Cameron's collection until his death. Lyons Island too is one of the two other replications known to exist, by me anyway. This work is by no means an exact copy of the first. There are changes in alignments, in the relative sizes of things, in the heavy-handed way the foliage has been rendered. Um, it tends to be more decorative than, um, than analytical, I think. In the absence of expansive blue shadow, and in the absence, in the addition of, excuse me, of expansive blue shadows on the river surface, and in the fact that no boatman attempts to dash around the rapids. Yet the, in the main, Lyons Islands too brings forward the same compositional elements found in uh, Lyons Island 1 and must have been painted in its presence. That's my argument anyway. My estimate of its date in, of production stems from a letter written by Emma to Mother Cameron from Augusta, Georgia on August 14, 1857, stating, quote, Cameron had another commission from Mr. Boyce for a landscape from the sketch below Knoxville, unquote. On the left, view of Moccasin Bend, Chattanooga, oil on canvas, 40 by 60 inches, signed and dated, lower left, Hunter Museum of American Art. After arriving in Chattanooga from Knoxville in early September 1856, the Camerons took a guest house on Lookout Mountain. Emma wrote Mother Cameron, quote, the town and environs are exceed exceedingly beautiful. The houses are scattered over a large surface plain and numerous small hills. And extending down to the Tennessee River, embraces about every variety of scenery. From some points of elevation, a lovely view is spread before us of river, island, mountain ranges, forest, town, villa, and last though not least, the noble form of Lookout Mountain. It is, a, it is covered to the very top with fine oak, chestnut, and other trees. Instead, uh, all this, uh, uh, indeed, all this, uh, this country is beautiful. Some of the noblest oaks and maple trees that we have ever seen. There is no difficulty for the artist to find a noble tree. The only trouble is to select from the multitude." Unquote. In the middle distance is Walden Ridge, later to be called Signal Mountain. And extending along the shore of the village, let's see, Let's see if we have one more of these. Yeah. I'm sorry, back. Be back. Um, and well, let's see. Let's go back one more. Thanks. And I don't quite see what I'm talking about. Uh, is a wooded rise the Camerons were to soon purchase and call Cameron Hill. Under a luminous sky sprinkled with almost invisible and weightless clouds. The Serpentine River courses its way through orange clay embankments. At the uh, right, a single craft. Let's try it again forward. At the right, a single craft, and I don't see that single craft. Let's see it forward again. Well, it's there somewhere. <laughs> At the right, a single craft uh, courses down the river to the Chattanooga Pier. Despite an overpowering glare of light, 
Cameron um, intuitively strengthens the outer contours of the rocks and mountains, tree masses, and the hills by darkening rather than illuminating them. In a similar way, he exaggerates the dark values of the shadows. Let's go back just one. one just go back one. Uh, he exaggerates the dark values of the shadows that passing clouds are casting over the valley. Such manipulation brings an added vitality and complexity to an already busy tableau. Can we go forward now? And forward. And forward. Colonel and Mrs. James A. Whiteside, son Charles and servants, oil on canvas 53 by 75 inches, signed its center on a letter, Hunter Museum of American Art, Chattanooga, Tennessee. In a conversation piece, we encounter Colonel Whiteside, his second wife, Harriet, their, their son Charles, and two black servants. The maid is a family slave named Jane. They pose on an open square tiled veranda, like ones the artists saw on the continent in old master paintings. The couple sit at a marble table under which are elegantly turned Let's see if we can go forward here. Nope. That's all right. Go back then, please. Uh, and <clears throat> under which are elegantly turned cabriole legs in Baroque ornamentation. With erect posture and crossed legs, white side sits on a red upholstered chair, the legs of which match those of the table. The painting brims with highly crafted trompe l'oeil renderings of objects in detail, such as the red purse resting on the table. Two imposing classical columns frame the outer edges of the piazza, a sturdy railing which rests on an urn -like, uh, a series of urn-like balusters lines the farther edge. We encounter the, bear, uh, we, we encounter the uh, a porter bearing a tray and drinks on the left stairway. As the Boyce family portrait, as in the Boyce family portrait that we saw earlier, all are dressed as if preparing to celebrate a milestone. The colonel wears a dark suit, white shirt and collar, and a light colored vest. She is clothed in a full length brown satin dress with tooled lace collar fastened with a bow tie. Let's go forward then, some of these details, there's the town. Uh, in the town uh, is a, uh, by the way, is a, uh, until late in the 19th century reconstruction period was the house that Whiteside had originally built for uh, his family in the early 1840s. Uh, here is a picture during the Civil War and we should see a grand, a very grand house, probably the grandest in Chattanooga. And uh, also next, here is the uh, Lookout Mountain Hotel where Cameron was to obtain a studio in 1857, uh, free of charge, which was quite a gift to, from White, Whiteside. Although the uh, painting that we've been talking about doesn't seem to have been made from those overhanging galleries, uh, as, as we hear from descriptions. Uh, forward. And forward, there, there's the uh, table. Uh, she is wearing um, lace sleeves, loosely draped, um, sheer black shawl under her, uh, let's go forward, and then let's go back again, <laughs> over her skirt, there, okay. Like Mrs. Mary Boyce, who we saw earlier, Harriet has misplaced or offhandedly discarded a festive hat, which we discover almost by accident on the floor behind the servant Jane's outstretched skirt. In Harriet's left hand, uh, she fingers an ornate handkerchief, which she has extracted from the red purse. The colonel holds an open book in his left hand. Let's see if we can, okay, good. Uh, in his left hand, and with his right points to a letter which he has removed from the envelope. Cameron consistently employed a neat Spencerian hand when writing but here has chosen to mystify us. We see words on the paper, but cannot read them. We can easily make out Whiteside's name on the envelope. 
and most agree that the signature on the letter reads, quote, J. Cameron. I think I would agree with that. Thus, the letter, uh, uh, the signing of the letter, serves the dual function of authenticating the painting and of also playing a routine role in an everyday event. Cameron worked on the painting during the first half of the year while he resided at Nashville's St. Cloud Hotel. The canvas was then shipped to, by, uh, from Nashville to the Lookout Mountain Hotel studio in, in mid-1859, in June. The Cameron correspondence makes no mention of a payment schedule for the painting, but judging from the, its similarity to the Boyce family portrait, Cameron would have expected $1,500 in cash or barter goods or in rent. And in fact, he got free rent. It is possible, however, that Whiteside made payment also in the form of Tennessee endorsed and unendorsed Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad bonds that were issued in the early 1850s. These paid 6% per annum interest and were to mature in 15 years. So he might have done that because the Camerons ended up with a good, a good deal of these bonds as the war came on and made them worthless. While admiring the scru scrupulous uh, detailing, and let's see, where are we now? Let's get to, let's go back if we can, sorry. Back, 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 and back. No, all right. Uh, while we admire the scrupulous detailing in the Whiteside family portrait, one sees linear contact, contours outperforming the uh, chiaroscuro or dark and light uh, aspects of form with the forward. Okay, and then now forward. Okay. Or glazed half tones make, to make things visible. This demonstrates how, quote, un Italian. Cameron was in completing this, his most important painting. The fastidious outlining of the colonel's hand and of the la letter's pages, for an example, are more like the analytical tour de force one finds in the works of 15th and, and 16th century Northern European Flemish masters than they are in com comparable paintings by uh, Titian and, and the Venetian, Venetian colors. The Whiteside portrait has aroused criticism, or perhaps better, interest for a number of technical curiosities that can be found within it. The perspectival alignment of the floor design. You find that overview? It doesn't quite work real well. The inconsistency of the sizes of the figures. Each has been sequentially added, it seems, to the painting rather than planned for in an initial sketch. Cameron complained of the difficulty of getting all the white sides in the painting to come and pose at the same time. There is also a curious diversion between lighting sources. An unfinished area to the far left, next to the porter who is bringing the drinks, brings into question whether the artist considered the painting to be actually finished. The landscape backdrop presents the most unsolvable curiosity. If we can go forward now, uh, to here, there we go. Moccasin Ben in the painting is painted, is pictured from the brow of Lookout Mountain. Chattanooga is a toy shrine, a toy tr town uh, like the Iowa towns painted by Grant Wood in the 1830s, in the 1930s. A play train trailing belching smoke pulls into town, reminding us of Whiteside's regional preeminence in building railroads. On the other hand, a puzzling mixture of landscape motifs overshadows the acknowledgement of his substantial industrial, political, and cultural achievements. What message was Cameron, if we could go back to the full view, is there a two close by? There you go. What message was Cameron trying to convey by grafting 
the grossly enlarged umbrella rock motif found elsewhere on Look, Lookout Mountain's brow on top of Moccasin Bend. If you look closely, that's what's happened here. Drawing upon once popular Freudian theory, William Henning Jr., the former curator of the Hunter, suggested Cameron's odd resort to artistic license here has the psychological effect of threatening, or symbolically threatening anyway, the marital harmony the white sides otherwise invoke. Go forward, 1860, 1860, okay. Uh, let's see, back one, see if it's still there, there we go. View from Cameron Hill, oil on canvas, 30 by 38 inches, unsigned, undated, Tennessee State Museum, Nashville. At the beginning of 1860, the Camerons plan to establish a small farm and orchard on Cameron Hill begins to take shape. In February, the couple plans to build a temporary structure, James described it as a stable, in which they could live while the more substantial home was being constructed. The stable was built in September in the following, in the following month, 74-year-old Mother Cameron arrived from Philadelphia and moved into the house. The painting of Cameron Hill was probably made prior to the building of the structure. The view is from the crest of the hill looking east toward the Tennessee River. Like a lens, the circular opening through the foliage pulls our eyes uh, to the river. Scattered about the, the foreground are cultivated fields, let me go forward, a few buildings and a road or two. As in other Camerons, the water's surface glows like burnished silver. On August 29th, 1860, Emma wrote, Cameron to, uh, desires to make a study from our hill before we leave for the winter, unquote. Next. Lions Island 3, oil on canvas, upstairs, 30 by 41 inches, signed and dated lower right, Jay's Cameron, 1861. Cameron is not known to have uh, strayed from Cameron Hill back to Knoxville during the year 1861. The alignments of motifs, the alignments of motifs here are much the same as they are in Lyons Island 1 and must have been painted uh, in the presence of the first study. However, several important changes can be noted. The primary elm has been reduced in size and now fits within the view. The wing dam and boatman have disappeared entirely. Two deer now rest in the foreground. A neatly constructed split rail fence bounds the clearing here. And a minuscule post, perhaps a grave marker, you have to see the actual painting to see this, can be tr detected to the right side of the cabin. A gate surrounds this post. There are no prominent shadows trailing across the river. In general, the landscape elements at the left side of the Holston are much more orderly and decorative than they are in other paintings in the series. And last, last one, last two. A waterfall, oil on canvas, 20 by 30 inches, signed and dated lower right, J. Cameron, 1862. Inscribed at lower right, Chattanooga, Tennessee, unquote. Despite the, uh, the inscription, the image was most likely inspired by a visit to Lula Falls, which is located on the Georgia side of Lookout Mountain in Walker County. Emma described one such visit in a letter dated September 15, 1856. By the time Cameron signed and dated this landscape, he and Mother Cameron remained alone on Cameron Hill. Emma was in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. 
vainly attempting to gain passage through the veteran lines and rejoin her husband. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much. <clears throat>